big kids. I'm fixing to read a story that's requested out of my book that I had written. They walk among us. Oh, you're wondering what that means. So you're fixing to find out. When I was 20 years old, I knew everything. All you had to do was ask me. I hadn't been long graduated from high school. Uh, yes, I did graduate. And some people thought I was quite the scholar. Once in the real world, getting a job wasn't hard, but the work sure was. I see contractors gave me a job working construction in Picayune, Mississippi. I was just a laborer, but I enjoyed every bit of it. We poured concrete, boy, we sweated, even built a railroad bridge. Never forget that. Like all construction jobs, this one ended and I got laid off. I did have a pretty good chunk of money in my pocket. I couldn't wait to get home. I was going to the river. I'd been thinking about catfishing, so I was ready to go. As soon as I pulled up to my place, I hooked up to my boat. I was going catfishing for a few days. I loved camping on the side of the river. The breakaway lodge landing was a beautiful sight on the Apalachicola River. When I put my boat in the river that afternoon, it was straight up three o'clock. I had all my gear, tent, lantern, and of course my trusty old Remington 22 Nylon 66. Like American Express, I never leave home without it. I was raring to go. Running up the river in my favorite rig, a 20 horse Johnson on my 14 foot Kennedy craft boat was like going to one of them head doctors. You know, the kind that talk to you on that couch. It was pure therapy. No worries, no stress, no obligations. I had the world by the tail. Just about the time I ran under the train trussle, I remembered that no one knew where I was at. Since I was a distant relative from He-Man, it weren't me I was worried about. It was Mama. I had forgotten to call Mama and Daddy to tell them that I was home from Mississippi. I hadn't mentioned to nobody that I was going catfishing for a few days. I quickly got my camp set up in the mouth of the same slough we would always camp at when we were little boys here on the side of the Apalachicola River. At 4.30, camp was set up. The fire was built. And for a redneck boy, I couldn't imagine nothing better. By dark 30, I had 23 bush hooks set and the grease of crackling and popping and cooking up three big swift water brim in my frying pan caught right there at my camp. Why, that sounded better than rain on a tin roof in the springtime. Man versus wild. If you're reading this, wipe your chin off because I know your mouth is slobbering. <laughs> I cleaned up after a fine camping supper of fish, hush, pu hush puppies, and sweet potato fries. The night sky was clear and the crackle of the fire was finally causing me to bog down. No tent for me tonight. Ain't nothing better than sleeping under the stars. The next morning, I checked the bush hooks early, got 19, man, that's catfish for you right there. I was using an old secret recipe, one of my old buddies got from old Sim Thompson. I hope I got the recipe right. He used cut bait mullet, marinated, and Aunt Jemima's butter-flavored maple syrup. If I heard the old secret recipe wrong, the catfish sure didn't know it. One of my biggest loves is to explore. I learned a lot from my grandpa, William Pitts Jr. He sure enjoyed knocking around in the woods, almost better than eating. Well, maybe not quite that much. I just tipped along at a slow speed, looking for a place to catch my eye. There it is, just ahead, a wide waterway flowing into Ingram. The mouth of that creek was covered by a thick, wild scuppernong vine. Some people call them wild bullaces. 
Anyway, up the creek I went. After turning in, I found that this little creek went way back up into tall virgin pine timber. I eased on up about a quarter mile through the big ridge of pines and noticed some hardwoods beginning to mix in with the pine trees. As I went a little further, the creek came to a dead end at a huge beaver dam. Time to explore. I tied my boat up and got out. <clears throat> As I walked way up and around the beaver pond, I noticed many squirrels found a deer horn with five points on one side. But what I didn't find was shotgun shells. I've learned to look for things like that. When I don't find any, I know that means ain't nobody been hunting here much. As I walked on, I found another beaver dam above the first one. Wow, looking across to the other side of that dam, I could see an old logger shack or a camp of some sort. With this area not being far from the Apalachicola National Forest, these woods had all kinds of camps. I was dying to go over to the other side of that beaver dam and pilfer through the old camp. You know, like you do when you go through people's junk at a garage sale. Only better. Ain't nobody there with a prize. So I started across the beaver dam. It was a long ways, and I knew I probably would get wet. Just as I got almost all the way over, I came up on a spot in the dam where there was a little water flowing over. I got kind of boggy. My old boots sunk up a little bit, so I was trying to be careful. Then it happened. Out of nowhere, a hot coal of fire hit the back of my right calf of my leg. I just didn't see him. I didn't. With everything else, the dam blended in so well. A sure enough grown cotton mouth had branded me right on the back of my leg. My split that second decision was to crawl the rest of the way to the old log camp. It was too far to, to go back across every bit of a hundred yards. I left my gun back at the boat. That was a no-no. All I had was my pocket knife. The cabin seemed like the best choice. The snake sure pumped some venom in me cause the scorching pain in my leg was affecting my ankle and my knee already. I had to hurry and see if there was something I could use in or around the old cabin. I, I saw some big claw marks as I checked the windows. Not real comforting. Even if you are dying from a snake bite, you could plainly see the shutters had been peeled off the windows. Pushing past the heebie-jeebies in my belly, I peeked in the window. At first glance, I could tell this place was way too old to have a first aid kit. I staggered around the front door and only to see the front door was clawed off the hinges. Out back behind the cabin was an old smokehouse. As I managed to get around the back of the smokehouse, the effects of the snake bite became more intense. I was sweating in a strange way. This was becoming very serious as I was dragging my fingers through the claw marks on the smokehouse wall. Something moved under my feet. A loud clank, a loud snap, and a blood-curdling scream that sounded like it came from a girl. But it wasn't from a girl. It was from me. The largest steel trap I had ever laid my eyes on, nearly four feet long, had sprung shut on my poor old right leg. As if it wasn't enough to get snake bit. I had stepped right on that bear trap. The snap was the sound of my bone cracking. I screamed again and it echoed through the tops of those tall trees. You could have heard it for miles. It hurt so bad. All I could do at this point was pray for God to give me a miracle. Make sure there wasn't anything wrong between me and God. 
Nobody knew where I was, so nobody was going to be looking for me. I hollered till I was hoarse, and the pain had numbed a bit. Surprised that I was still alive, it was ironic that the bear trap was above the snake bite, somewhat prolonging my life, not letting the venom flow. The trap was old and huge. I couldn't squeeze the springs apart to save my life. It was late afternoon. My life was nearing an end. My biggest worry at this point was would anyone find me dead, much less alive. As I began to drift in and out, I could hear something coming up right in front of me. But I couldn't see anything. I started wondering if it was just all in my head. And there really was nothing there. I kept hearing something over my shoulder as I tried to see. I mostly just see the blur. Then I saw him right out of the darkness. Those black pupils, those gold eyes. He was over my shoulder. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a gator. Or the venom playing tricks on me. It stared at me not blinking as if in a standoff. At one point, I figured he was trying to decide if I was worth eating or not. So with my last bit of strength, I decided to do what I do best. I just started talking to him. Those of you who know me, I know you're surprised. That maybe it was the venom. I don't know now what I even said to him. It must have worked. It bent down, picked me up, and those eyes seemed to really show a concern for me. Whatever it was, he had no problem picking up my 160-pound self right up. He was holding me so gently I didn't even try to fight to get out of his hands. I could see long brown hair covering him. He walked up tall like a man. His eyes still glowed in the dark. The last thing I remember was going up to the side of a high oak ridge on the back of that beaver pond. Then it was black.